We spend far too much time worried about what makes us different than the next person or better than the next person and not enough time thinking about why we should respect the next person. We all have a story, an overarching theme that runs through our lives and makes us who we are. The problem is, we think that since each of our stories is different, there's not a lot of perceived value or shared struggle. But we have far more in common than we can imagine, and what motivates one person can certainly help us as well. The Third Lab Podcast is about understanding, respecting, and appreciating the struggle that it takes to overcome immeasurable odds in order to reach your destiny. Join me as I interview and bond with some of the most inspiring and incredible people, diving into their why to get a full understanding of their being. Without each other, we have nothing. So let's go on this adventure together and take on the future with open minds and open hearts. Welcome to the Third Lap Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for once again joining me on a third lap podcast. I'm really excited today. I'm excited every episode. Um, So this episode is no different, but I really get a chance to connect with someone that I'm looking forward to learning more about them professionally, personally, just their whole experience and history um, leading up to this conversation today. So I have the pleasure of introducing Jasmine Omarogbe consultant and entrepreneur and just all around dope human being. Jasmine, what's going on? How are you doing today? What's up? I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, just to talk briefly about how we met. So sort of unconventional, uh, we met through the Urban Philadelphia Professionals Network on GroupMe. Uh, We, I think I had posted the, um, the podcast, like an episode of the podcast in there, if I'm not mistaken. And you reached out to me, I had like an invitation of folks that were interested in joining me. Uh, You reached out to me and yeah, we've just been kind of going back and forth ever since, had a conversation, what was it about a week ago, week and a half ago? ago, yeah. (laughs) Something like that, Um, just to get a chance to know each other better. And and, I wanted to gauge your interest in coming to join me. So two weeks later, here you are. So clearly you are excited and and interested in coming on the, the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, just anything you want to add about sort of how we know each other, that first sort of interaction? Uh, no, just, well, just that you had um, Kyle, the conductor on, and he was a friend of mine. And so that when I was checking out your podcast and looking at the episodes, I was so happy to see somebody I knew and to listen to the, your episode with him. And he has an amazing story and he's somebody I admire and respect. So I knew if you knew him and he knew you, y'all are both good people. So I'm excited about it. Yeah, shout out to Kyle. That's the homie, man. I'm looking forward to the new year and being able to go back and serve on over real weekends, giveaways. Um, just a real amazing guy. And the way we both, you if, go listen to the podcast episode. You'll learn how we met too. Um, this is this is Jasmine's episode, so I'm not going to get down to the well with, with uh, Kyle. But yeah, Kyle's a really amazing guy. And so Jasmine, uh, where are you from? This is a Rep Your Hood section. So Rep Your Hood, where are you from? I am from the mean streets of Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I'm from the Twin Cities, born and raised, um, actually just right outside in an area called Robbinsdale, but I grew up in North Minneapolis. It's a great place, very cold and snowy, so it's uh, so I don't live there anymore, but it's, it's a nice city. Shout out to Minneapolis. Uh, like I told you, I have a homie that lives out there. Shout out to Jeff. Uh, shout out to him and his family. They're still in Minneapolis. I don't know how this Black man from Queens went to Minnesota and stayed forever. He's he's there, like this is his winter wonderland, I guess now. Um, yeah. But shouts out to all the black and brown people in Minneapolis. Uh, Jasmine actually put me on. You said that there's actually a pretty good contingent of like Africans living in Minneapolis, correct? Yep, East That's Africans, but also um, Latinx folks, also nice. like Hmong and various folks of Asian, yeah. of Asian descent too. It's actually much more diverse than people imagine. Yeah, I... It's much more diverse than I imagined, I'm so sure, because I thought Jeff was the only Black person out there for a really no. long time. <laughs> a bunch of us out there. It is cold, but I think in terms of the, the opportunities yep. and what's offered there, it really, and it's a nice, clean city, lots of stuff to do. So when it's warm, it's a nice place to be. That's what's up. Yeah, it's close to Canada, too, because I know he and his wife shoot over to Canada uh, every so often, too. That's what's yep. up. Um, and so uh, you also mentioned living and being sort of influenced by some other places. So uh, anywhere else you just want to name that, you know, has played a, a major influence on you professionally, personally, combination of the two? Sure. So I left Minneapolis in 2012 and I've lived in Boston, 
Massachusetts, Raleigh, North Carolina, Norfolk, Virginia, and now in Philadelphia for the past three, almost four years or so. So each place that I've lived has been very different from one another and has taught me things. I've made built community in different places. Um, and some I would go back to and some I wouldn't. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to speculate which ones you'll go back to, which ones you won't go back to. I know which one I'm not looking to go back to anytime soon, and that's Boston, Massachusetts. Um, you know. Shout out to you, though, for living there. And actually, I've been kicking around this whole Harvard graduate school thing since we talked about it. Um, I would probably be the only way that I would ever, ever, ever live in Boston. That'll make it millions. If somebody paid me millions to live in Boston, I'm going to make money. Um oh, yeah you know, collect the check, save, and then get up out of Boston. But um, yeah, shout outs to uh, all of those places. I would say um, outside of Minneapolis, was there any other, like one of those cities that you lived in that really helped to influence you and like sort of the direction that you've gone in? Well, no, a lot of them have like Boston, even though I didn't have a, a I didn't like living in Boston necessarily. I was able to find things I liked about it, but it also was the place I like living the least. And it made me so much more grateful for every other place that I've gone to. So it's like, whoo, at least it's not Boston. <laughs> you know. So um, being there where it's like cold, there's a, a lot of history of racism and discrimination. And so like when I moved from Boston for grad school to North Carolina, I was like, wow, this is so great. There's so many people here who look like me. We have friends, we can hang out. Like it was just, it made everything so much better. So that was kind of the bottom for me and everything else is just kind of the top. So it did influence my outlook because moving from Minneapolis, Minnesota, where people are nice, it's great. It was like a culture shock to get into Boston and people don't speak. They don't even make eye contact when they walk by. They don't, at least in Minneapolis, like black people say hello to each other. <laughs> like they they nod or they do the things. And in Boston, it wasn't even like that. So it, it gave me a, a wake up call um, that I think I carry with me in everywhere that I go. Okay, that's what's up. And so, yeah, I mean, that leads us sort of right into your story. Jasmine was born as a baby. You were born in Minneapolis, you said, yeah. right? So as a baby born in Minneapolis, here we are today. X number of years later in Philadelphia. So fill us in, you know, especially around like your career, um, because, you know, you're now an entrepreneur doing your own thing out here. I love it. I always encourage folks that have the spirit to get out here and hustle for their own stuff. And so, yeah, how did you start on your pathway? Um, and you can kind of choose that the origin kind of anywhere. Um, most folks start with either college or graduating from college, but I'm gonna kind of leave that up to you. Um, but yeah, how did you start? How did you start figuring out what your passions were in life? Um, personally and professionally? So I will even take it back before college to really church. So growing up, um, my mom was very involved in church. And so I was also very involved and we were in um, like Baptist and apostolic, like the kind of church where you go every day type of thing. And you stay all day on Sunday from the morning until the night. So I was doing children's church. I was giving speeches. I was singing in choirs. Like I did like everything because my mom was at church. So I had to be at church too. But I will say that that's where I got a lot of my leadership skills from of learning how to speak in front of a, a congregation of people learning how to express myself clearly learning about some of the arts and those sorts of things and so um although church is not a factor in my life at this particular moment i think that i got a, a strong foundation from being in church there's lots of good skills in terms of leadership that i was able to learn by leading children's church teaching sunday school all those sorts of things and then from from there also going into a lot of camps i was my dad and um, my stepmom had me in different camps where we would go to different places and be there for a week and learn different things and i was able to meet a lot of different people um and so that also was a big part of my leadership of getting those opportunities getting scholarships getting grants learning how those application processes worked and all of that and so um even on the larger scale thinking about where i'm from and my background my mom and my father are separated and they've been separated for most of my most of my life and so my it's a really interesting dichotomy in my mind because my father um, he lived in the suburbs outside of Minneapolis he is a lawyer he's kind of the corporate side my mom has always been direct service so working with people who are um, just out of prison out of jail people who are homeless serving meals so she's always been kind of on the front lines um, and with my father doing other work that's kind of supports that people who are on the front lines as well. My stepmom has always been big at giving. She's a dentist um, and was always big on, you know, donating things to shelters or doing pro bono work. So I come from a family of folks who has been well-respected in the Minneapolis community, but also all of them had their own way of giving. 
So it, it, they taught me from a very young age how important it was to serve the community, to give back, to donate money, to donate time. Um, and even some of the people that we came across with, with my mom, because we, we, my mom had a business, a sewing business in West Broadway in Minneapolis. And that's kind of a main thoroughfare where um, people who are down on their luck are uh, often. And so, you know, my mom might be talking somebody down who was planning to uh, die by suicide. And like this person's like, I got a gun, I'm about to go do it today. And watching my mom, listening to my mom have this conversation with this person that now they're like, you know what, I have some hope. I actually don't have to go do that. I can go do X, Y, Z. Like, so even seeing my mom give people hope and give life in that way as a young child, and I'm, you know, six, seven, eight, just in the background of the, of the shop doing homework or whatever else. And it's like, all of that has had an impact on me. So knowing that my dad was more in the corporate space, my mom was more on the front lines, I'm looking at the ways that I can serve people and also be on the corporate side or do well. You know, I want to, I want to do good and do well, as they say. Um, so my life is kind of a, a, a juxtaposition of those things. And so um, from there, high school, very active in everything, all the clubs, all the stuff. Um, I worked, you know, at the hospital doing candy striping and all that kind of stuff. So lots of experiences. And then once I got to college, at that point, I thought I wanted to be an elementary education teacher because I was working at the YMCA. I was working with after school programs. I loved kids so much. And then I realized, like, actually, <laughs> they don't get paid a lot, right? They're not necessarily well respected, which they should be. But the hours are early and I'm not a morning person. And I'm like, actually, do I want to head into that career? And I was in this career exploration class. And so in the process of interviewing teachers and looking more about the salaries and what they have to do, I said, actually, that may not be the best fit. And so in the midst of that, the person who taught that career exploration class, she was a, a counselor in the career center. And she reached out to me. They had an opening. She said, hey, Jasmine, do you want to be a, a career advisor? I'm like, mm, well, sure. You know, it's a student job. So I was able to go in there. I think they called us peer ambassadors or something at the time. And so I started working at the Career Center my freshman year at the University of Minnesota. Um, and that is where I really, my eyes were opened. We were trained on how to give resume workshops, how to teach people about networking, interviewing. Like I didn't know at the time how valuable those skills would be to not only me, but to all the people who I was in contact with. So even in college, people were giving me their resumes all the time and asking me all these questions and I'm helping everybody out. But I think one of the challenges we had while we were there was getting our, our multicultural students and students of color to come into the career center. So that was part of my job. Okay, let's go talk to the organizations. Let's see if we can get them to come in. Let's do resume workshops around campus. But one thing that I wish I knew at that time, or I wish college students knew, is how important it is to take advantage of that while you're on a college campus. Because after that, after you leave college, unless you're at a workforce center or in some kind of special program, you don't get free resume reviews. You don't get people bringing employers to your door, right, to have interviews with. So not realizing really how much of a valuable skill I was learning at that time, but it, it was able to, I was able to help people then. And then ever since then, I've just kind of been known in my friend circles as like, yeah, give your resume to Jasmine. She'll doctor it up. You know, she'll help you figure out what to do. And there are people who I who I helped back in 2008, 2009, who are still using like those same skills that I, I taught them at that time to get jobs today. Cause it's kind of, once you learn, you can kind of update your own resume and all that stuff. But it's just little things that a lot of people I think don't think about and things that matter to employers, right? Because if you have a bunch of typos, well, those are typos. Yeah, okay, but when there's a hundred other people who are either at your same level of credentials or higher, you need to make sure you don't have typos, right? So little things that people may not catch, um, I realize make the difference. And I've had the pleasure of being on a lot of hiring committees you know, throughout my career too. And it's like, oh no, those typos do make a difference because I'm here advocating for this person, you know, and there's another committee of people who are like, nope, nope, nope. And I'm like, no, yeah, but they have a really good heart. They're great at it. No, it's the piece of paper is what matters at that point. So I will say that I think that that's unfair. I will say that I think the process of being judged for 10 seconds, your whole life is on a piece of paper and somebody looks at it and decides whether or not you are worthy or capable or have the skills necessary to do a job. I don't think it's fair, but because that's the way that we are, do what we're what's happening in this country I my goal is to help people stand out the best and to do the best and so I was doing that throughout college I was also working in admissions offices I, I then went into um, student affairs so retention I noticed that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities there's 50,000 students maybe less than 10 percent were black and I noticed that I was an African-American admissions counselor specifically and I realized that we were bringing them in but those students were not leaving 
or they were stopping out, dropping out and leaving with debt, but not with degrees. So I'm like, well, this isn't, this doesn't feel good. I feel like I'm, I'm part of the system. I'm the man at this point who's bringing them in and not helping them get out. So I transitioned from admissions to retention and persistence. So working in the multicultural center there. And that is where I felt like, wow, these systems are really not built to support certain students, right? Um, so after being on the side of bringing them in and then also being on the side of helping them stay there and realizing what a struggle it was academically and socially for students to be successful in places that they didn't feel welcome, they didn't feel like they belonged. Sometimes they had academic challenges where they weren't su uh, supported by the institution. I'm like this isn't working. So that led me to look at uh, going to graduate school. Because if, if you want to work in higher ed, you pretty much have to have at least a master's to do anything at, a, at an institution. And so I was looking at either higher education programs or HR programs, because I'm still about the HR career center recruiter type of piece. And I applied to different programs. Um, and one of my friends was at Harvard and she's like, you got to apply. And of course, my parents wanted me to, to apply. And I'm like, oh, you know, I wasn't really feeling it. I said, I'm, I'm not going to belong there. I'm probably going to be the only one who looks like me. I'm going to have to wear a blazer with a crest on it. Right. Because I just didn't know much about Harvard. You know what you kind of hear or see. And so I, I, apl I applied the last day it was due, like the day of the application. I'm like, all right, you know what? <laughs> Listen, just <laughs> we'll see. Right. Because if it's meant to be, it's going to happen. Um, but Vanderbilt was my top choice. That's where I wanted to go. And so I submitted those applications um, and I was admitted to all the programs that I applied to, thankfully. So I had to make a choice now, right? <laughs> had to make a choice of the HR path or the higher ed path. Um, and what happened was I, I knew I probably wanted to do higher education because I have the passion for students. I wanted to help students like me get in and out of college. I was really big on the college access and how can we fix this? All of this stuff is broken. You know, more of us should be in higher education because my dad growing up always told me education was the greatest equalizer. So no matter what you do, nobody can take your education away from you. you. No matter what you look like, your skin color, you will have that forever. And I know that that was the way that I was able to um, transcend some circumstances and the way my father was coming from Nigeria and where he is now. Um, being That's the only thing that would have you know, helped him become more socially mobile in America. And so I, I, I said, higher education is going to be it. I visited Vanderbilt and Harvard, and then it was like no contest. I'm like, oh, I have to go to Harvard, even though I was crying. I was literally crying in the financial aid office when she said, oh, you're going to have to take loans. And I'm like, what? Because I didn't have any loans from undergrad. Thankfully, I had a bunch of scholarships. And so this was my first time taking on a large amount of debt. And I was literally like crying. He was a Black woman in the financial aid office. She's like, baby, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and so, and so I, I, I decided I did. I did that, and it was worth it. So going from Minneapolis, church, leadership stuff, and then going to college, working in admissions, working in um, the career center, to going to Harvard, getting a, a master's in higher education. And then it was time to do the work. Like once you get the degree, it was great. Uh, it didn't feel great all the time while I was there. I will say that. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's like a lot of work. So many nights in the library. I was a part of seven different student organizations. Um, I will say, just for the sake of saying it, that it was very different than what I expected. So um, the graduate school is very, operates very differently than the Harvard College does and undergrad does. So it's not what you see on TV necessarily. Um, it was about 30% students of color that year. And my friends were like the greatest part, right? We would, <laughs> they, like the support network that we had there, the fun that we had there, like it was totally worth the entire experience. Every, I would, I wouldn't want to do it again, but I would if I had to do it again, I would um, just because of the network that you have after that is also very valuable. So from Harvard, then I went to North Carolina State University. I moved from Boston to Raleigh and then started working in student affairs, working with African-American students again. Um, and again, really cherishing and treasuring the one on one opportunities I had to meet with students, but realizing that the larger system isn't supporting them right so figuring that out and trying to navigate my place in that because a lot of the students saw me as like an older sister and they're like well we're going to walk out of class we're going to protest because there was a lot of racial turmoil and stuff that was going on and it's like well I'm teaching I was teaching a class at the point and so there I remember a critical moment for me of like I'm teaching a class at this institution y'all are talking about walking out and I'm supporting you like where do I like I'm, I'm part of the institution where I'm supposed to say hey don't walk out of class but I'm also a black person and a black woman and I'm like yeah y'all should walk out like let them know that you're not happy with what's going on so it's like those kind of juxtapositions were very interesting um, and then transition from there to Old Dominion University in Norfolk Virginia where I also worked with uh, students of color intercultural relations all those sorts of things then came the big switch and that's where I moved from education to tech and that's what brought me to Philadelphia is I said I was really 
upset about the way that higher education operated. And it's like, I'm working a lot of hours. I'm not being paid a lot of money. The students that I'm working with also are not getting degrees, right? So when we have a 25% or less graduation rate, and that's like at the highest level, that's for all students, not even for the students who are in the most vulnerable populations. What are we doing here? Like, why is this university still open? You know, so like, and that's not just to say at Old Dominion University, but at universities across the country, it's like, where's the accountability? We're bringing folks in, we're not helping them at that point. So I'm like, I'm over this. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm losing myself. So I need to do make a transition. And that's what brought me to tech. And I know we'll talk about kind of where I am now um, in that story, but that's kind of the, the long and winding road um, that brought me to where I am now. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. And you mentioned how people come to you for like resume help and just sort of like the job training stuff. It's invaluable and it's a game, right? Like it's, it's very mechanical how it's approached. And it's funny because I read this report, I forget the publication that put it out, but they were talking about how like they took 20 resumes of African-American job seekers and it cha changed them into tr traditional white names. And it was like a 30, 40% uptick in just the responses to it. And so, you know, like you said, in, in talent myself, I understand I'm staunchly opposed to cover letters. I am a cover letter hater. I hate these things. Um, so we could get those out the way right now. But, you know, I understand the value in a CV or a resume, but I also understand the value of connecting with that person. And like I do the best that I can to connect with people that seem intriguing on paper. You know, at some point you can't connect with everybody just because it's a time crunch. Um, and as we're headed into peak hiring season now, time is crunching as we speak. But again, back to the point here, um, being able to know how to play the game, how to construct a resume, um, proofreading your own resume, having other people proofread it, grammatical errors count that will take you out the mix in a minute. I remember one organization I work for, two errors and it's over. And so once I can say a second error on a third one, I toss the resume, you, you're out of the race. Those sorts of things are important, but if you don't, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and, you know, so I love the fact, Jasmine, that you're out here, uh, really will get to where you are now and like where you're headed. But previously, even you were willing to like take that time to meet with people. Um, you know, one thing that I've learned in the six, I think six, maybe seven years of education, I stopped counting. Um, it's just, it's just, I'm here and I'm, I'm living it. But um, one thing that I realized is that so many things prevent students that look like ourselves from achieving, even going to college, um, because so many of the students, and I had a great conversation with one of like the directors of the education program a couple of years ago, and she was saying about her students, predominantly black students that come from Baltimore is that they're underprepared to do work in college. And so when it came time to take the certification test, most of them left the program, went into a general studies program so that they didn't have to get certified in college and then did an alt route certification program once they graduated because mm -hmm. it gave them another additional two years to kind of fill those gaps to take those tests. At the time, it was like, that's crazy. Like we're sitting here trying to train up all of these black and brown teachers and not even addressing the fact that the education that they get K through 12 is just not where it needs to be. And then to your point right around just seeing people not graduating, like we get them into college, like we where everybody's whole mantra, especially in charter is get these kids to college and is, is less people that you see to and through, right? Like the and through has now become how this has sort of evolved because we realize persistence. These kids were dropping out freshman year, dropping out sophomore year. And like you said, accruing debt but not getting an education. You got kids taking, you know, basic level courses, racking up 10, 20,000, 30,000 in debt, and then go home, right? Like I had students that left the Bronx, went to college, came right back to the Bronx, left mm -hmm. Brooklyn, went to college, came right back to Brooklyn. And so what was the point? If you left your, if, if we've told you your whole life, your only way out of your situation is to go to college. You go to college, you fail out and you end up right back in your situation. Like how demoralizing is that, right? You know, right. it's so um, we need more people like yourself addressing this issue on both sides of the fence, getting students in because that's important. We want to give them access, but then also working with them to make sure that they stay, not just our student athletes, but all of our kids, right? Like, hey, we want to keep the football and basketball players in because they, they, they make us money that we can tangibly see. Um, but I think that a lot of these students that are kind of in the midst, in the, in the mix or in the midst of 
this huge change um, just get lost in the sauce. And, you know, especially going to Minnesota, my God, there's so many people, so many opportunities to get lost. <laughs> That's true. At one point, I want to just add to that something that I think is important that I don't know is discussed is like you mentioned when students leave their community and everyone's excited and, you know, all the charter schools, okay, we got 100% of our students into college, et cetera. There's a lot of hype around that. But when you come back, the shame, right? The shame, especially if you're first generation of man, I was gonna carry the my family on my back. We were, I was gonna be the first one to graduate from college. And then your first semester, you're not successful. Like when you go back home, the shame of your community, of your family, of like, how do you handle that? Because just like there's not career services for free for life, there's also not therapy services, which I think we should have a lot more free <laughs> or low cost therapy options. But how do you mentally reconcile like, man, everybody's hopes and dreams. People gave me money at my trunk party or at my graduation party. And now I'm back in the same community and I'm working a job that may, may not be helping me live up to my full potential. Like what do students do with that? Yeah, plus one to that, plus a thousand to that. Um, and then to add an additional layer to that layer, the kids that were 4.0, 4.2 GPAs at their school and then go to a Harvard, a Yale, a Emory, and then are for the first time in their lives dealing with like the micro and macro aggression sometimes of like white people and, and the dominant white culture. Had a conversation with the first gen college student not too long ago and they were saying like their parents told them don't go to college. Like, yo, don't go to college. Like you could open a small business. This is what we do. We open small businesses. We grind that chicken up. We get more of the businesses. Like nobody's going to college. Like why are we going to college? So, you know, when you do go and then have these difficulties and have to come home, it, it's a lot of shame, right? And what do you do at that point? You get kids that just don't even go home. Like they that just stay where their college is and just live in the college, afraid to, you know, go back to their shop in their community. Uh, and I think just in general, man, like we have to do more to destigmatize that because we're all going to feel like it's I had a horrible time my freshman year of college. Like that was the, one of the hardest years of my life. Um, thankfully, I was able to like make amends for it and get things right down the path. But I didn't come home to shame. Right. Like I didn't ever fear that if I went home that, you know, people would look at me differently, had to work. I couldn't just sleep on the couch like I had to figure it out. But, you know, we, we have to do better supporting our students and helping them understand that, like, there's no losing. You either, when do you learn, right? If you fall down, pick yourself back up, learn from that instance and don't fall like that again. Uh, but yeah, when our kids are failing out of college, man, we have to support them and help them understand that, yo, maybe spending two years at a community college is the best route anyway. Save that money and then jump to a four-year school where you can finish those last two years with significantly less debt, if any. Right, right. I also think that we need to destigmatize professional, vocational, and trade schools too. Because especially now that I'm on this real estate journey, learning and seeing how much contractors are being paid and how hard it is to find contractors who show up and do the work. Like, I think that there are people who are forced into this four-year path where they could have been much better off had they went the trade school for 21 weeks and got a, a certification because people are paid if the goal is to get money or to get a good job college of course especially at this point is not the only way to do that and I think there's too much of this that's the only path that's for everybody now for me who can't do anything with their hands <laughs> college was best for me but for somebody else who's really kinesthetic learner and all of that they, they can go to trade school and be just fine like that's the thing don't act like those are dead end jobs or those aren't going to get you anywhere like you can open your own plumbing and you can make bank because all the people who went to college who don't have those skills need to pay you to come fix their toilets like they need you it's, it's a very valuable skill so I do wish more of our communities were having those conversations when I was coming up I think it was like well do you want to go to the military or you want to go to college and it's like like those are those it is that is that all we got like no it, like it wasn't even a thing to talk about trade school or, or being a mechanic and all those like those type sorts of things and I wish that we had more of those routes available for students who may not be the traditional four-year learner. I, again, I'm a plus one anything you say today, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I agree. And for me, military wasn't even a choice, even though a lot of the men in my family had served, my mom wasn't hearing it. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, you're going to Harvard or Yale or one of these schools. Like she poured all her time, energy, every single resource. And I'm an only child. So she had nowhere else to put it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so she put it all into me. Um, and, and I was the whole and I fizzled, right? Like I, I told you before, you know, it took me five years to graduate high school, graduated with a 1.8 GPA. And so like all of that energy just dissipated, right? It just kind of fizzled. 
um, as I'm barely even graduated high school. And, you know, I think about kids in my situation. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, didn't, I still, to this day, what I want to accomplish is steadily evolving because there are so many different things that I want to be able to influence over time. And so uh, let's talk about another thing. Like, why are we pressuring kids to make these choices so early in life, right? Um, and I love the fact that you mentioned careers. Um, yeah, like I have a cousin who does like different jobs. He's been working in factories for years. And I mean, this man makes more money than I do will tell himself quickly, and that's the other piece is folks that work with their hands, aren't necessarily college educated, spend a lot of time sort of downplaying their education on how smart they are, because we look at it from a very traditional lens. And I always tell them the same people, right? Like you said, listen, I gotta pay you to come in here and fix this for me. And so you have intelligence in a way that I lack. I have intelligence in a way that you lack, but that doesn't make either of us smarter than the other person. Who's the smartest person? The smartest person is the one that's figuring out how to hustle themselves out of this rat race and be able to provide for their family on their own terms, right? Like us folks still working nine to five our whole lives. Like we, that's not smart. That's not winning. You're not playing the game smarter at all. You're playing the game like people told you to play it. Um, right. And you got to get outside the box. All of the things that you mentioned, Jasmine, are really important. Um, this is the Third Lap Podcast. This is Mal Davis here with Jasmine Omorogbe talking about her pathway to where she is in her life. And so Jasmine, we talked about what led you to this point. Um, you realizing you played two very integral roles in higher education, both getting students into college, but then also working on persistence and realizing that, okay, this isn't it. <laughs> like, I don't, this isn't the space I see myself continuing to occupy, made the transition into technology, the ed tech space specifically, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so now in the ed tech space, which is like the new frontier of education for sure. Um, and as we're in a pandemic and like so much of what we're doing is ed technology, right? And like people not realizing this has been sort of percolating behind the scenes for years now. Um, it was pushed to the forefront because like we just didn't have a choice like teleeducation and all of these things is just sort of what we have to do right now. But talk to us, you know, where are you right now? What is it that you're currently doing? How has this transition, this shift, how has it been going for you? And then ultimately, Jasmine, where do you see yourself going in the future? Sure. So let me back up a little bit to right prior to where I am now, because I moved um, from working in higher education in Norfolk, Virginia to Philadelphia, where I actually started with an admission software company. And that was my first jump. And it was kind of, it was big. It was a big transition because people who were in higher ed are like, oh, you're leaving. You weren't dedicated to the students. Like there's this, this whole like guilt thing that socially I was dealing with. And I'm like, are y'all serious? Like y'all are all miserable. And you want me to just stay here and be miserable with you? Like, what is the point? But you find a lot of people in higher ed who do stay for life. Like, this is just what it is. I don't like it, but I gotta be. And it's like, that's not ever my mentality. It's like, no, I can do better. I can be better. I can leave this situation. And so dealing with that guilt was something, but then I jumped, I jumped into the admissions um, software space. And four months after I had moved to Philly, I was laid off. And that was my first corporate job. That was my first experience ever being laid off. And so that was big for me because it happened so quickly, <laughs> it happened so quickly. And it was like, I was next to people who had worked at that company for 20 years. And we were both all let go in the same three minute meeting. And I remember going to get the garbage bag under the sink in the, in the kitchen break room, went to go get a garbage bag. And they're like, you gotta be off the premises in 45 minutes. And I'm like, with well, my computer, they had already like locked everything down. I'm like, are y'all serious? Like, whoa. So I'm getting, putting my stuff in a garbage bag about to get back on the train and go home and just in shock because I've never again been in that position where I was let go involuntarily or I was let, I was not working um, involuntarily. And so that was a big, a big shift for me of like, wow, nothing is promised. You know, like I had just moved, they helped me move and it's like, and y'all let me go right here. But they were facing a lot of different challenges internally, but that was like a wake up call of like, okay, this isn't education. Cause in education layoffs are very rare. You know, we've seen them this year only because of the pandemic but it's typically not something that happens. Um, because of that lack of accountability. So even if you're not doing your job in higher ed, you still get promoted. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. But companies in corporate are about um, the bottom line. So if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense, right? And so being let go, I was unemployed for maybe about six weeks. And during that time, I thankfully had support from my parents, you know, I was getting unemployment, etc. So I wasn't worried about kind of where my next meal was coming from. But it was time for me to really reflect, okay, what do I want? Where am I going? What's happening? And then I was able to work with a nonprofit um, in Philadelphia that worked in Philadelphia public schools. 
And so I just moved to Philly. And so for me to be working with 12 to 13 Philadelphia public schools, Philadelphia, Camden, and Norristown, I was, my eyes were opened again. I'm like, wow, Philadelphia is a different place. And this public school system, I'm like, seeing, seeing school be canceled because there's no AC in the buildings. It's like, or there was a big thing with asbestos and mold and like kids can't breathe in the classrooms. That was heartbreaking for me, especially as an educator. Like, you know, in my past, I had worked with kids all the time. And so being in those spaces, it was a temporary job. It was four months, but I'm really glad I was able to see that and to, to really get a sense of like, wow, there's a lot of work to be done. So when I'm thinking about what nonprofit boards I want to join and what I want to do, ultimately part of it is always going to be around education. Cause I think we owe our babies so much better than what they're getting right? Whether it be in the charter schools or the public schools, or even like, I know Catholic schools and private schools are a big thing here in Philly too. I'm like, even still, like we just, we have to do so much better. Um, so that's always going to be a part of the, the, the vision and the story. So I worked there and then I was able to, with the help of someone who worked at the company already transitioned to an HR software company, which is where I work right now. And I work with universities and colleges to help them update their technologies to better serve students. So I come in from the lens of having worked in higher ed, of having seen students be successful and unsuccessful. And we can say, hey, students need to know what unsubsidized and subsidized loans are, right? And the, the software that we work with tells them that sort of thing when they're accepting their loans. So that at upfront, the families know, like we use terminology like out of pocket with loans, out of pocket without loans. And there are figures there. So the whole idea here is that the ways that technology and software can facilitate some of that student success. Because if you don't know the difference between subsidized and unsubsidized loans, and you just say, oh, give me all of them, that's a big lifelong thing, right? That especially we know there's the student debt crisis right now. It's a big deal. And it can really impact when people can buy homes, when they can start building wealth, whether or not they ever can, and what their families and future families do. So I'm still passionate about education. I'm still passionate about students getting into and out of college. But now I'm doing it from the aspect of working with all of higher education. So I'm working with hundreds of universities and colleges instead of just working in one where I felt like I wasn't really able to make the larger impact that I wanted to, where I was working with students on an individual basis and I really appreciated and cherished that, but I knew that the university or the colleges weren't serving them the best. So now I'm kind of taking myself zooming out and being able to work with the entire landscape and knowing that schools who do have our software, schools who are invested in their students can serve their students better and I feel better about that as a whole. So that's kind of where I am now. Um, I'm a consultant. So I travel pre-COVID times, travel to different universities and colleges. I even meet with their students. We give them the software on their phones and app and we let them like play around with it and say, okay, you know, how do you like this? What is your feedback on it? That sort of thing. So I'm, I'm still in the education sphere, but in the tech space, things are so much more efficient. Like there's accountability. There are like my job, my quality of life has been increased greatly. Like 180 to what it was when I was working in higher education. Um, and, and what I realized about that is that I'm happy about what I'm doing. I, I wake up and I'm looking forward to going to work. And so that comes back to my career piece. I want other people to be able to experience that where you don't like people sometimes hate their job and they just feel like, yep, this is my sentence. This is what I have to do. I hate going to work. I hate getting up. And it's like, I want to I, I feel inspired when I wake up. I'm excited about the work I'm doing. I have a great team. I have a great manager. I don't want people, especially people who look like me, where we already have enough barriers on the day-to-day -day basis, I don't want them to be stuck in jobs that they don't want to be in or stuck making a little bit of money when it's like, you know, every, every time you change jobs, you have an opportunity, hopefully, to make more money or to have a salary jump or um, title jump. So if you stay in the same job for 10, 15 years, you realize your earning potential is decreased, right? Because you're not able to make those jumps. And so I know sometimes things like fear hold people back right? Like, I don't know. I don't know how to get another job or what if the new job is this or that? And it's like, well, you, sometimes you got to take a chance. So if you, if you don't go out on a limb, you'll never get the fruit. So part of, of me be leaving higher ed and jumping into that tech space, which I wasn't familiar with, but then realizing like, wow, the water's fine over here. This is actually way better, right? I'm well compensated. I'm valued. I'm doing this work that makes me feel good. It makes me feel fulfilled. But more importantly, thinking about the tech side, because they value people who work there, I'm now able to donate money to organizations that are on the front lines. I don't have to feel guilty like that. I'm not you know, working 15 hours a day with students anymore. I can give money to college access organizations. I can serve on boards. I mentor a whole bunch of students, right? So I'm still doing my part to do good, 
um, and to do good with the work that I'm doing too, but even on my own, doing good in that way. And then with the career business, helping people realize there's greater out there for you. You don't have to feel stuck, but you do have to present yourself on paper in, in an interview in a way that's going to get you hired. So how do you expand your mindset? Like, and sometimes people are stuck in certain organizations or certain roles. I'm only a this and that's all I can be. And it's like, no, did you know that you can use those same skills and be a this you know, and then this is, is maybe a way better career path for you. So that's part of my passion is like, because I had this great jump from ed to tech, because my life, I feel like it's so much better. And I have so much more freedom and mental capacity to do things I want and love. I want to help other people feel that. And that's where I want to go eventually is to have my business, um, which is the career consultancy. I would love to do just speaking group coaching. I'm building courses right now. So that's what my thing, building a course to start with like a resume reboot type of course, um, because I was finding that everybody wanted to meet with me individually. And that was taking a lot of my freedom away. So I'm like, how can I help people on a greater scale? Well, I can build a course that way they can take it on their own pace. And then if they want to chat with me after the course, now we can have options, but we're not starting from zero with every single person. So that's my goal. Um, I want to be helping Black people, helping especially women, helping brown people, helping under people in underrepresented communities are where my heart is because to your point before, the way that your name is spelled can change people's perceptions of you on a piece of paper. And so we have so many obstacles that other folks don't. So not even unconscious bias, but conscious bias is working sometimes against us in these processes. So how can I use the insight and the knowledge that I have to help them at least, at least you can't control how someone else is going to look at your name, but you can make sure that your resume is on point and that if you go into the no, no pile, they may have to explain to somebody why they put you in the no pile, right? And when everything was crisp and tight and you had all these accomplishments listed. So I want to help people at least do their own with what, what's in their control to be the best they can be to set themselves up for new opportunities. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. For sure. And that jump from, uh, I made a similar jump out of education into ed tech. And then I jumped out of ed tech back into education um, <laughs> because that the opportunity was dope, but it just wasn't for me from like where I was in my life. There it was just a lot of traveling and the traveling took its toll. That's why I was telling you, I was in Boston, DC, some weeks. I don't even know where I am. And it just took a toll. But I, I fully appreciate what you said about making that change and making that switch. I mean, I think that like for us specifically as black, brown, you know, you, you're the descendant of an immigrant, um, it's generational. We were taught what our parents were taught and our parents were taught what their parents were taught. And over time, it just deconstructed into a place where it just didn't make sense any longer because we can't work in a factory, right? Like my cousin, but my cousin is like 53 years old. Like he's, he's in that age demographic where like that is something that's sustainable for what he's trying to accomplish. But myself, I don't see myself at 35, 36, walking into a factory and like that being where I, I, I retire from. We're a pandemic again, away from having none of these opportunities. And so, you know, I hope that as people are surviving and, you know, being careful and taking the necessary steps to ensure the health of themselves and others through, you know, coronavirus, that they're also realizing what you said, which is that we've built skills over time that we saw only fell into this bucket, but like, they can transition into other things. Like a lot of the work that I do in recruitment, people have helped me realize is the same work that's done in policy. I never even thought about it, right? But, you know, having a conversation with one of the homies who's in policy and he was like, yeah, I mean, you do the same thing I do is just, you call it different things. <laughs> and I was like, oh, damn, okay, um, interesting. <laughs> but, you know, I had never really looked at it or thought about it from that perspective. And so anybody listening, a money job is a thing of the past, right? Like you could work your money job um, and they talk about building runway. So you have to build enough runway to be able to pivot or transition from what you're doing to what you want to do. Don't be irresponsible. Not all of us are Jeff Bezos with a wealthy wife so we could just quit and be held down, right? Like none, what, if you're listening to this show, you are not in the position of having a wealthy <laughs> partner more than likely <laughs> that will be a safety net. Be responsible though, be intelligent, continue to gain skills and traction. Jasmine, like you said, real estate, I think that's a huge one. A lot, a lot of folks that I know, my wife included, investing in the stock market and figuring out how to play the, the stock game. Um, figure it out. What, what is it that you love? Start pouring more and more time into that bucket. 
start saving money and investing money in your opportunities and in yourself and your, your transition into a new career and then make the jump, right? Jump. And if you fall, you learn the lesson, pick yourself up and try over again. But you know, we're a generation of people that have to get away from, I am going to work at this place because this is what I'm supposed to do. What you're supposed to do in life is find happiness and joy and, and live this thing to the best of your ability. Um, slaving away at a job that you hate is never going to solve your problems. And it filters into every other aspect of your life. You're going to find yourself talking to your therapist about your job ball session and not about the 20 years ago when you had X thing happen that you still need to work through. You're working through stuff that you have control over. Um, and so, yeah, Jasmine, I 100% agree. You know, I love to see people taking that leap of faith in themselves. Um, you know, be smart, build up that safety net. Don't just, it's a difference between the gamble and the calculated risk, right? Like you're gambling when you don't know what's on the other side. A calculated risk means that you built in some things here and you understand what you're making this move into. Um, but always take that jump, always believe in yourself. You'll never get to where you're trying to go through somebody else's means. It just won't happen. Um, and so you talked about your consultancy business um, and like being on boards um, and just being invested in like, the plight of students that look like yourself and are interested in going to college and like continuing to persist through. Ultimately though, where do you see yourself in the long run? Like 10 years, 20 years from now, where do you see yourself? So I'd love to be working for myself as an entrepreneur. Um, I would love to still be having my consultancy, but I, I really do just want to be helping as many people as possible. So if that's through courses, if that's through the speaking, if that's through um, the still coaching people, I want to have, I want to be able to hire people eventually. So I will be not only an entrepreneur, but an employer that is fair and that is paying people well and, you know, giving, supporting other people's livelihoods. But also on the personal side, like I plan to have hopefully in 10 years, at least five properties. That's my goal. I want at least five properties in Philly. Um, but I want to go from like single family homes or multifamily homes to then apartment buildings and looking at syndication and how those things work. Because I do think that real estate is a big wealth generator. It's a risk. So when we talk about risk and reward, right? But if you look at a lot of the nation's millionaires and billionaires, real estate is a major factor in how they got there, right? So having a diversified portfolio. So I'm investing in stocks. I'm doing real estate. I have my own business. Right now I have a nine to five um, that I love and enjoy. So at least even that doesn't feel like work to me all the time. You know, like I, I'm not hating it. I love what I'm able to do, but I know I'm not going to do that forever. Uh, but even I will say too, like that jump of moving from education to tech and seeing how my coworkers live and the things that they purchase, it just, and the way that they handle their money. For me, that was mind blowing. It was like, wow, whoever would have thought that you can afford these types of things, or this is the, the, the way that you all are treated and you're you know, like they're happy. Like, you know, it's good. It's just, it was interesting to me to think when we talk about like poverty mindset and we talk about like money mindset or, or growth mindsets, being exposed to things that you not aren't typically or haven't been exposed to can really be a game changer. So thankfully I've been able to say, oh, wow. So you all have trust. That's how you, that's where you put your money away for your kids. Like before this job, I never knew people own could have trust and that's where you're supposed to put some money. Like, so every step of the way kind of teaches you something. I learned from the people around me. I learned from what I'm doing. And so I can't really say like, well, my where I'm going to be in, you know, 15, 20 years. My plan is to retire early. I definitely don't want to wait until I'm 66. I think that's a trick of America of like, oh, okay, you work really hard. You grind all the time. And then when you're old, now you have time to do stuff. It's like, no, I want to be able to have fun. I want to be able to travel. I want to be able to do the things I do. I want to do before that point. So what I'm working on now is how do I create streams of income? How do I create passive income? I was just talking to my mom this morning. Like, I can't wait until I, I I'm just able to wake up maybe check a couple emails and then do whatever I want to do for the rest of the day. <laughs> and maybe, maybe take a phone call here or there, but I can be on whoever's beach I want to. I can be with whoever I want to doing whatever I want to do. And I want that level of freedom. So no matter what I'm doing, whatever businesses I have, whatever investments I have, I want them to be making money and working for me. And the ultimate goal is not just to amass a whole bunch of money, but my personal goal is. You're listening to the third lap podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. When I talked about earlier, like doing well and doing good. So doing well financially, but to do good. So I'm donating money to different organizations. I'm giving to charities. I'm volunteering. Like part of the reason why I would like some more disposable income is so I can support other folks who are doing the work or I can support other causes that I believe in. So there is a balance for me of like, not just this kind of like, let me get all the money I can ever get. No, like what can I do to impact the world having those funds? 
right? Because me, if I'm just grinding, like I can, okay, I can give $20 a year. Great. But if I'm really, if I'm doing something else where I'm getting this passive income, well, now I can give $200,000 a year. And that's enough to really change the life of a nonprofit or to change students' lives. So my goal is to do that work so that I can even do more of the work that is, is close to my heart as well. Absolutely. And I love that, you know, like you said, you want to be able to grind, you want to have the bread to do what you want, but also be able to like pay it forward um, and make these opportunities possible for other young men and women, um, trans folks that are trying to make this transition. And, you know, it's so important that we continue to comprehend across the African diaspora, but I'll definitely say African American people specifically, like, it takes a community right? Like it's, we're not, the, the bootstrap mentality doesn't exist. And my dad told me since a child, he's like, if you try to lift yourself up by your bootstraps, they snap. He was like, never buy into it. Don't believe it. And so since a little, little, little dude, I was always very anti that thought process and really comprehended, especially being exposed to the Black Panthers and like some of the other more revolutionary groups in the late sixties of like the community involvement and investment, right? And building together, um, and it's something that you don't see a lot and will will say is this or that, or, you know, take it back to slavery. But what you do see is that we really struggle to work together towards like a community, a community goal. We really get caught up in this thought process of there can only be one or like a handful of people. It can't be all of us. Right. And like, you know, we may not all make it, but several of us can like you see all of these entertainers who make all of this money, but very few of them funnel it back into their neighborhoods. Um, but then you see wealthy Jewish people that are funneling so many of their resources back into their communities. Italian Americans, Irish Americans, like folks are turning around and reinvesting this money in their community. Um, Slim Thug, who I love, one of the Houston rappers, he's been building like low income housing forever in Houston. And you know, you don't hear a lot about it, but it's something when you see it, like, voila like it's amazing somebody figured it out like we can all work towards the same sort of goals with each other it's not like i get my money and then i run off away and i never come back you don't have to live there but you do have to reinvest in the places that help you become who you are um and create those opportunities open up those doors and those pathways mentor people like you said that you still work with students now it's like you know download into them the things that you know that they need to be successful so that they can better navigate the pathways that are ahead of them. So why are you so intently invested on making sure that people that look like yourself, especially black and brown women, have these same sort of opportunities? What is your why? What keeps you moving forward and gets you out of bed in the morning? Sure. So I think that a couple of different things come to mind. One is uh, the people can't see, but you have on a shirt that says free Angela. But Angela Davis has a has a quote around um, has a quote that says, "We must always attempt to lift as we climb, right?" And so, and then and then Michelle Obama also has a quote about like when you walk through the door, you don't shut it behind you. So I think that that's part of my like DNA. When I mentioned my parents all being in different like different levels of service, different capacities, but always giving back within their unique positions, I think that's just who I am at this point, right? And also I know that I didn't get where I was alone. So that is really the big driver is that I come from a community where not everybody is successful. If I were to go back home today, I could see the same people who I went to high school with who are not doing the same things or having the same um, passion in life that I have for a number of different reasons. So I kind of think about that phrase that says like, therefore there, but the grace Therefore, but the grace of God go I or something like that. But the phrase is basically saying like, but a few different choices, I could be in a completely different place. Um, when I was in Norfolk, I had the opportunity of working at the women's jail and I taught a women's empowerment class and, and learning the stories of those women. It's like, man, you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong person. And now your whole entire life is changed. And it may have been out of love for someone that they were with, or it may have been, you know, them doing the best they could to take care of their children. So it's not even things that you can fault them for sometimes, but it's like, man, I could, this could be me. And I was so thankful that when I went into those jails, I was teaching a class once a week, I got to leave. I got to go in there. It didn't smell nice. It was like a, a very sterile environment. And then I was able to walk out. And so to think a couple choices or a couple different wrong place, wrong time situations, and I could be in that same situation. So part of what drives me is knowing I didn't get where I am alone. 
as I mentioned before, I got a ton of scholarships. People had to give real life money for those scholarships, hard earned dollars. Those people had to say, wow, we have enough that we want to help other people. And they don't know me. Like, you know, we write like letters to donors and thank you for giving us this money type of thing. I don't know the people who individually gave money that helped me get the education that I have. So I just feel like people have poured into me. Who am I to not pour back out? Like, who am I to just say, okay, now thank y'all. I'm going to just continue to grow a mass greed or to amass money. Like who, who am I to do that? I just don't feel like that's None of that is in my DNA. Now, that's not how I was raised. If you think about African-American traditions, if you think about Nigerian traditions, like you mentioned before, things about the community, things about a village, it takes a village to raise a child, right? So even my parents, they had help raising me. So, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm not gonna be the one that stops the cycle of giving back and of helping other people, especially because I feel there are so many ways that I have been blessed, like beyond belief of like so many things on a daily basis that I don't have to worry about. You know, I'm not worried about where my next meal is coming from. I may or may not want to go cook it, but I have the food, right? I, if I don't have the food, I have a car, right? I live in a place where I have grocery stores. I don't live in a food desert. Like there's so many levels to that. Like I have the money to go to the grocery store. I have the money for the car, the gas to get to the grocery store. Like whereas some people don't even have any level of that, right? And so because of the gratitude that I feel for where I am in, in my life, there's just no way I could not do whatever I can in, in my power to help other people. And one thing I will say, the nuance to that is that, especially when I was working for the nonprofit or when I was working education, I kind of felt like, man, you know, I got to sacrifice my life. Like I got to give my life to these causes, these students, I love them so much. I got to just, and so what I've done and talking about that, that transition from education to tech, if I also realize now that I'm getting older, the importance of self-preservation, of self-care, of, hey, rest is productive, of, hey, you can't do it all. You can't be all things to all people or more importantly, you can't pour from an empty cup. So now I'm kind of finding a better balance of, okay, I can give, I can do those things, but I can also have my own life. I can maintain um, what myself for my family, for my friends, for my things like, like, like that. So part of the why is how do I keep what I need to for myself to feel fulfilled or to feel myself to be a good person, right? Because if, if my cup is empty, I can't pour to anybody else. So how do I start there with making sure that I'm happy? I, like you mentioned, I'm in therapy. I'm dealing with my traumas. I'm uh, being the best person that I can be and having the most impact. And then also giving of what I have of sharing my insights, sharing my experiences to help others get closer to the best that they can be or, the, or, who, or their dreams or whatever they want to do. So I kind of think it's this balance um, that I, that, that's my why. That's why I wake up because I know I, I, thankful. I'm grateful for all the people who helped me here. And then I know I can be one of those people for somebody else. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned the free Angela shirt that I have on right now. So I wore this the last time I saw my mom. Uh, nah, I saw her a couple months ago and I wore it. She was like, you know, that Angela's free, right? It's like, <laughs> yo, listen, man, don't start. Don't start right now. I don't need this. I don't need this energy. Came from Philly, drove all this time to be harassed. Um, so every time I put this shirt on, I'm like, yeah, I would just want to tell people like, yes, I know Angela is free. That's not the point. <laughs> she got me paranoid now. But, um, but no, you, you have mentioned those quotes. One that I have here on my LinkedIn um, profile, which is the function of freedom is to free someone else from Toni Morrison. And like that resonates with me so heavily across every single thing that I do, because I am free to, like you said, go to the supermarket or just go and spend money on stupid little things. I bought a PlayStation 5, like, you know, like that's not a need, I didn't need it. And my right. mind, my brain was like, yo, you need that, get that. But um, in reality, like that was very much so just uh, a purchase that I was able to make, but it doesn't escape me that there are people that can barely pay for their food or pay for their apartment or pay to keep their car. And so, you know, Jasmine, just keep being dope, yo. Like, just keep, just keep doing it. Keep being amazing. Um, keep opening those doors. I love what you said from Michelle Obama. Again, like that was my mentality in the rap when I was rapping. It was like, if I, if when I make it, like I'm, I'm kicking the door. That's what I tell everybody: kick the door off the hinges, open up all the windows. If they right. put the door back, they have to work to put that door back because ain't no door no more. When we go through doors, I want y'all to unscrew the hinges, take the drawn <laughs> off, and take it with you. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. And so, Jasmine, you know, we've talked at length sort of about where you're from. So you're repping the great, the great state of Minnesota. Minneapolis hood was good. 
<laughs> um, but having spent time in numerous other places, um, including Boston, which we talked about briefly, and then your time in higher education and how that sort of influenced your mentality towards ultimately where you want to go and what you would like to do in life. Um, and you're now in this ed tech space, which seems to be like a nice sort of mutual fit for you and also the opportunity that you're in. Um, you mentioned that you're extremely happy in the work that you do, which makes me very happy to hear. I love hearing people um, say that they love what they do. And ultimately, you want to be able to pull up on beaches around the world, you know, open up emails every now and again, make a couple calls and, and you know, the racks come in it. <laughs> and, yes. Yeah, perfect. And then you talked about what your passion is, which is, again, just making that change and providing those opportunities for people to be able to go out here and just do dope things like yourself. Um, and so we're at the end, I say this, if people that listen to this podcast know that I'm gonna say this four more times like I usually do. I say we at the end for like 20 minutes. So clearly not, but we're, we're getting closer. To, I'm gonna do that. We're getting closer to the end. <laughs> um, and so what are your motivational thoughts for the people? So this portion specifically, um, is to like stamp anything that you want people to walk away with. So after they listen to your episode, they get to this component and it's like, this is what Jasmine wants me to walk away with. So what are a couple of thoughts that you really want to share with people, stamp for people so that when they walk away from listening to your uh, episode, they, they just feel enlightened afterwards? Sure. So I would say two things. And the first one is to say yes right? To say yes, when it makes sense. And so I talked before about one of my, like the pains of like seeing people who are, feel like they're stuck, who feel like they can't move beyond. So to know in your heart that you are worthy of the experiences that you want, like what you, you're worthy of what you desire. And it, it takes work to get there and it may take multiple steps, but if you, if you keep saying no, if you don't even get started, then you'll never be able to get there. So I will say that in my life, I never thought I'd live in Philadelphia. I never thought I'd be in tech. I never thought any of these things, but saying yes to little opportunities along the way allowed me to meet and connect with people that brought me to where I am now, where I feel comfortable, where I'm happy, where I'm growing, where I have more capacity and space to do other things. So saying yes to things that may on the, on the surface be something you would typically say no to, if it feels right, <laughs> go with it, right? Go with it, follow your joy and go where that good energy is. The second thing I would say is to, especially when I talk about career stuff, is that there's a, a, a proverb from a movie that says, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready, right? <laughs> it may be a little rougher than that. If you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready is what it actually says, right? And so the idea that not waiting until like, okay, now I don't have a job. Now it's time for me to look like, no, <laughs> keep your resume updated all the time, every month. Make, put a calendar reminder to go update your resume with the things you've been doing, making time to network and to connect with people and not to say, oh, that person doesn't look like me or that person is in this field. What could they have to offer me? Like realizing that there's mutual benefit to meet with different people. You never know who knows who, which who could give you which opportunity or who opportunity you could give to somebody else that you meet. So, so that, that saying yes and that, that staying ready, which could look like a number of different things, but it's not to wait. Don't feel like you have to wait until some magical point because it's really the building all around that gets you to where you want to get to eventually. I laugh when you said the saying yes, um, but saying yes to things that make sense. This is great. Always sunny in Philadelphia episode where uh, Charlie. So if you anyone that watches the show, Dennis convinces Charlie to like saying yes and like saying yes. He says yes to like everything like the man just doesn't say no, sort of like the Jim Carrey movie. Um, and it's just hilarious where they end up. But to your point specifically, um, yeah, I mean, you have to say yes. You, if you, I was one of those people that said no to a lot of stuff because of various issues, but mostly around like anxiety and like social anxiety. And so I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. I don't, I had a great opportunity to meet Anthony Hamilton in college and didn't go. Um, and a couple of the homies went and it was like, yo, you're bugging. Like, what were you doing when you said no to this? And, you know, I had a chance to see Paul Mooney and Dick Gregory live in New York City. Do you think I went? And I ain't go. Because I, I said, I said no. And to this day, I'm like, what was I doing when I said no to this? Right. Um, and so, you know, I've had to learn sort of the hard way, the importance of saying no to, saying no to things that could potentially 
help you grow and, and move in a better direction. So I've become way more open-minded. I mean, this whole podcast was basically saying yes to like a lot of work. <laughs> it's like I underestimated how much work this was, but this has been one of the best things that ever happened to me, um, especially recently. And so I 100% co-sign the saying yes component. If you haven't seen the Always Sunny episode, it's the gang goes to Atlantic City. Um, it's one of like the later seasons, but it's a great episode about saying yes and how it could work out for you in a more comedic way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and then staying ready, you, you have to. Uh, I tell homies all the time, you know, what you said, which is like, don't start looking when you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. I suggest that people like, yo, apply out of state, like apply in places that you may not even really be interested in working, certainly has a less chance of it getting back to your employer that you're looking but like get the practice reps in because you don't want to start relying on your ability to get a job when it's time to get a job, especially if you haven't done it in years, like you've been at the same place forever. And now you realize that like this time has come where you need to make this transition, get the practice in now, because if you're sending your resume out and you feel like, okay, I can do this work and you never hear from anybody, um, then that means that like, you now have to take a step back. You now have to network in a different way. You have to approach your whole job search process differently because if you're not getting the results that you feel as though you should, there's something that you need to change because like their response to you won't necessarily change. Like as a recruiter, as a talent person, and I'm sure you could speak to this too. Like we're trained to read a resume this way, mm-hmm. conduct the phone screen this way, um, interact with candidates this way. And if people don't do X, Y, and Z to not interact at all, right? And so you shared your motivational thoughts for the people. So yeah, talk to me about the books. You sent over a couple options. Um, I would love to hear from you why you chose those books and which books are they? Sure. So a couple books. There's so many books that I think can help, but I just picked a couple um, that uh, have been kind of pivotal for me. One is The Big Leap, and it's The Big Leap, colon, Conquer Your Hidden Fear and Take Life to the Next Level by Gay Hendricks. And he has a podcast as well and a YouTube video. But The Big Leap is really about how sometimes we can self-sabotage. We feel like there's a level of success we can reach. And when we reach it, then we kind of unconsciously do things to bring us back down to the level that we're comfortable, right? Because being great means like, oh, well, what if they think I'm too good? Or what if this? What if that? So um, it's, it's really good. It opened my eyes to a lot of things around just shining, feel like I'm shining too bright. Well, let me shine, let me dim my light because I'm shining too bright. And that book talks a lot about how to um, overcome that and just to really realize that you should shine as bright as you can. And everybody else has the capacity to shine as bright as they can. And whether they do or don't is their business, but you have to to keep your own shine um, that bright. How to Talk to Anyone is a book by Leo Loundis. I'm not sure, I've never heard it pronounced, but I think it's Loundis. And it is a book with 92 little tips and tricks about how to talk to people, how to feel comfortable. Um, like you mentioned before, to having um, talking about social anxiety or depression or those sorts of challenges. Reading books like this, I think, can help people feel more comfortable about how do you walk into a room and introduce yourself? How do you walk into a room and have a presence? How do you find something to talk to anybody about? Because you never, there are people who I met on planes, just a quick like, hey, where are you going? How are you from? Oh, I own a company. Oh, here's a card. And then I was able, actually, it's a real story. I was able to get my friend a job from somebody who I met on a plane. Like, And if, if we had to just sat down and I would have been nervous to talk to him or we just would have just carried on our own business, that would have never happened. So that book is really great for anyone, even whether you're an introvert, extrovert, whether you like people or don't, that's a great book to talk about some different tricks. And then um, Becoming by Michelle Obama, of course, she is someone who I look up to very strongly. Um, I mentioned her quote above, but just really talking and learning about her story of humble beginnings and learning how she has kept the poise, the grace, the intelligence that we see her carry herself with. So it's just a really inspiring story, excuse me, inspiring story. Yeah, Jasmine, where can people find you on social media? Where can people find your work? Sure. So the best place to connect with me is on my website, which is Jasmine, J-A-S-M-I-N-E-O-M-O.com. Um, I also have jasmineomo.com. There's a business page on Facebook. Um, I will be, there'll be an Instagram for the business as well at, at some point. But the best place right now is for my website. I have all the media and the things I've been doing um, up there as well. So it's, it's great to connect there. And the course, once I build the course, the resume reboot course, it'll be up available on the website as well. That's what's up. Yeah, definitely check out Jasmine's website. Um, definitely check out her social media and Instagram. It's like Instagram is my worst enemy, but it's the it's it's the one that you gotta deal with. You know, I, I I'm not a big IG person. Folks have been telling me get better. And I'm like, it's easy to tell me to get better. It's my but my wife is trying to help me get better. I refuse her help because I don't want to get better. I want to stay ignorant to Instagram. 
I'm just I'm you talking about saying yes. Now what? <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. And Partially. the thing is, like, Clubhouse is the wave now, so you already late. Like, you ain't even. <laughs> Yo, I went on Clubhouse and I looked. I scrolled up. I scrolled down and I turned it off. I just put the phone back down. I looked around. I seen what people was talking about. I was like, man, I'm gonna put this. But there are some really. It's really great. It can be great for business, just like Instagram. Yeah. Like, it depends on who you follow, what types of conversations you're part of. You can Kyle. Use- Kyle no. hit me today and was like, yo, I got a, a clubhouse if you need it. And I was like, ah, it's a reminder. I'm already on clubhouse. I got like the, the no face, no bio, nothing. I haven't done. Like I literally downloaded the app because my boy was hounding me about it. I downloaded it. I looked at it. I again, scrolled down, scrolled back up. was like, well, I'm good. I'm going to go do something else right now. Um, so I'm going to jump in today. Everybody had listening, had I appreciate you. Teddy, thank you for sharing the link. Jasmine pressuring me. She peer pressuring me into using Clubhouse now. <laughs> but see, the thing is, I can't even get on Clubhouse because it's um, only for iOS, Apple users. And nah, I have an you, Android phone. I got a, I got an Android. No, let's talk about it after the show. Because <laughs> I want to know. Because it's been exclusive. The app was not available to Android. I'm on it. I know for a fact I'm on it. Because I got on it through my Android. Because he sent me an iOS link. And I was like, huh. I downloaded an iOS link. Um, so I'm on Android. We'll talk about it in a second. I got you. Yep. I'm a, I'll am show you. I might not be. So listen, <laughs> other listeners, I might have wasted three minutes saying how I was on this John scrolling. Maybe that's why I didn't enjoy myself because I wasn't looking at the real clubhouse. <laughs> I was looking at the knockoff version in, in, in the, in the uh, Android store. So be careful. Apparently there's a knockoff clubhouse version going around. They didn't spell it right. The house got two O's in it. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Jasmine, so listen, I appreciate you. You know, we are at the end. I want to respect your time here. Any last words, any last things you want to share with folks as we sign out? No, I just want to uh, give you quick kudos for, for stepping out, for saying yes to this podcast. I think it's a great way that you're providing value to all the listeners of hearing and valuing people's stories. Like you said, everybody has a story and not everybody gets the chance to share it. Um, or to learn from other people's stories. So thank you for the work that you are doing for yourself, for your family, for your community, and for all of the listeners as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, everybody does, you know, and I was so fortunate through all of these random conversations that I've had with people to realize like, yo, that's like, that's amazing. Like you've, you've inspired me to now want to go and do something different. Um, And like I said, when we first connected, I was like, all right, let me start recording some of these conversations uh, and really use this as a platform to spin it around and give people the opportunity to tell their story. You know, we see folks like we see you with your business. We see you in this ed tech space. We have no idea what it took for you to even get here in the first place. We have no idea where you're from. We have no idea who you've interacted with and connected with. We have no idea what motivates you. All we know is that you've made it here and you're successful and you're happy. And so, you know, I really am enjoying the process it's a lot of work and people that do podcasts I know that they sit here like we could have told you that I'm like yeah I was I wasn't listening I said no to their information it was like that's a lot of work it's like I'm gonna just do this this is easy (laughs) I'm like four months like oh my god (laughs) this is not as easy as I thought um but yeah you know this has been great just being able to give a platform to so many awesome and amazing people I continue to look forward to using this as a platform to connect with folks that are really trying to just continue to change the world around them um, and be the change in the world that they want to see. And so, you know, again, Jasmine, this was just a great opportunity. Um, This was us both saying yes to an opportunity, right? Like you said yes by reaching out to me. Um, We both said yes by connecting on the podcast. This has been just awesome. Um, Again, this is Mal Davis here with the Third Lap Podcast talking to Jasmine Omarogbe. Um, I got it right. She's shaking her head. Yeah, so I got it right. I think I got it right every time. Yo, I'm, I'm proud of myself today, yo, because I messed up my man. Yao, I apologize, Yao. Um, I was calling him Yao for like the first, or y'all for the first 20 minutes. Like, <laughs> he was like, yo, it's, it's Yao, by the way. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> but you learned. You I got learned. it, yo. I, I'm not going to make that mistake again. <laughs> so shout out, Yao. My bad, homie. Um, but yeah, so just this was amazing Jasmine thank you again for joining me again I'm really looking forward to seeing how your business and you evolve over time Um, and so each one teach one we all learn together once again everybody thank you so much for tuning in and make sure you check out the episode next week have a good one thank you for tuning in to another episode of the third lap podcast this is your host Mal Davis 
please visit thethirdlappodcast.com for more information about the podcast, about our guests, and also to see our reading list. You can find us at The Third Lap Podcast on LinkedIn and Facebook, at Third Lap on Twitter, and at Third underscore Lap underscore Podcast on Instagram. If you know anyone that would be great to be featured on this show, please reach out to our host, Mal Davis. He's always looking for interesting people to learn more about them and to talk about their pathway. Thank you so much again. Have a good one.